Hello everyone, welcome to The Calling Within. Today we have Pascal Coyne in the house, who is a long-term Buddhist practitioner. And we're going to talk about all things Buddhism to do with the Buddhist philosophy, mm -hmm. all the different nice and interesting concepts in Buddhism that you probably heard of, but we're here to dismantle and really <laughs> uncover all the Buddhist truths. So Pascal, welcome. Thank you very much. It's an absolute privilege to be here. I love talking about Buddhism. So thank you. Really pleased to be here. I'm so excited for this conversation. I have learned a little bit about Buddhism from your friend Paul. Paul Ayers, yes. I watched your podcast with him. It was fantastic. Well done, mate. It's really good. He really covered, well, everything really. So I guess we're just going to get under some of those concepts a bit, like a part two maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a nice sort of addition to the, the <laughs> one we did with him. And I suggest then we hit it off and I'm going to ask you, what are sort of some core teachings of Buddhism? There's 84,000. So let's focus on the most important one. Uh, the most important and core teaching of Buddhism is that all human beings, without exception, possess, in a very real sense, the Buddha nature. It's universal. That's the core teaching. So Shakyamuni Buddha attains enlightenment, realizes this is inherent in human life, not just him, he's not special. He's like, oh my God, everyone has this. It's like, this is the truth of life. Everyone possesses this inherent potential. As, as everyone possesses all the elements of the universe, similarly, everyone possesses that within the universe which can realize. So, bam, that's the core teaching. Then, of course, it's like, well, that's all very well, but look at the nine o'clock news, right? So what's going on? And then we see the challenges. Not only do people possess the highest light, but also the darkest dark. And so that manifests as things like, and again, Paul covered this, greed in its overt form, but also in its subtle forms too, just stinginess of spirit, as well as the obvious distribution of wealth and other factors. Ignorance to the fact that life is precious. And of course, arrogance, personal and international, group arrogance, group ego, identity, nationality, fundamentalism, all those things. So those coming out of fundamental darkness are these functions. And then, of course, karma, desire, suffering, fear, anxiety, doubt, jealousy, complaint, bitterness all these other relentless energies as well. And every time we do something, we implant it to do it again. And so this is the great struggle. So the Buddhism is a teaching of a, a bloke discovered something and thought, wow, I need to tell everyone. And how incredible that a, a teaching that claims no divinity, has no miracles, is just human beings, would actually become a global religion. That's kind of incredible. Um, and so that would be the core teaching is we all possess Buddha nature, but then the practice would be how to bring it out through those things I described. And then that's the 84,000 teachings of how to go about doing that. That's just a figure they pull out of the air just to mean a whole lot. Wow. And I want to make sure that the listeners understand the Buddha nature piece because we okay. spoke about it with Paul and he explained that Buddha nature is kind of the inherent goodness that we all human beings have. And I guess to bring out that Buddha nature would be through chanting or doing the various sort of Buddhist practices and the, not necessarily end goal, but the byproduct of doing them quite diligently yeah. would be enlightenment. Would that be a fair summary of that? Yeah, one is the cause, Buddha nature. Buddhahood is the effect, parenthood, adulthood, the attainment thereof. Buddha is a, a word that means awake. That's it. Buddha, like a Buddha, Buddha. It's just awake, right? So Buddha nature, again, refers to this inherent level of consciousness we all possess. So you mentioned good. It's, it's the ultimate good. It is life itself. So Buddha means to be awakened to this inherent truth that we all possess, that we are one with the universe that we are all equal, and that life is precious. That's the, the awakening. So, again, to go back to the things that stop us. So, for example, we spend most of our time in that space we think is us, kind of behind our face somewhere, isn't it? You kind of think it's there, but then you, if you touch yourself there, you realize, no, that's not it either, but it feels like it's there. 
localized to our senses. We are not generally aware of the processes that are going on in our life, neuromuscular, cardiovascular, the production of, of blood, the uh, immune systems, like our whole body is a miracle of life. And when we can just connect to that, we're joyful, we're Buddha, but we tend to get locked into here and start commenting on how we're not good enough. Luckily, the rest of our body, the 77 trillion cells are not going there. They're good enough. The heart, come on, we can do it. Oxygen, like the whole body is completely committed to life. Buddha is life itself. Buddha is life itself. That's the awakening. Obviously, that's a simplistic way, but think about it. The joy of life, to wake up and to feel grateful, not because of what you've got or done or what other people have said about you, but just to be alive. Personally, this is what I think they should teach in schools. Appreciation. So that's what Buddha nature is, the, the, the inherent... Everyone knows this. If you're on an airplane and you're going along and suddenly you look out and is that smoke? And then you look at the other side and then people screaming and the maxes and the blood, you think you're going to die, you're going to die. And then suddenly somehow the pilot does this, lands in the Hudson and whatever it is. When you get off that plane and you're going through, everything will be more vivid. People will be so precious to you. You'll appreciate life. That potential was always there. It's just that in the sort of taking it for granted business and this, blah, 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 what am I going to do next? I'm not good enough for that. We are disconnected from this ever-present inherent truth. Life is precious. So Buddhist practice, Buddha nature, is to awaken to this and to enjoy it. Wow, you said yeah. so much goodness there. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just hearing you speak about it and the passion that you speak it mm -hmm. with is just so inspiring to me. And I really wish more people kind of stepped on their journey of awakening and really mm -hmm. understanding I can do something about it. Like mm. I have this thing inside of me, which is life itself that I can bring mm. out. And as a byproduct of me bringing this out, this is going to affect life externally outside of me. Yes. But actually, it all begins internally within me. Mm -hmm. And I really wish, and I think this is happening, but people are finding out this truth. And I think that's going to awaken so many hearts. And yeah, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to the world awakening with this. That's beautifully put. And the name of your podcast, The Calling Within, is the Buddha nature. It's that thing we all know. And we, especially when we're children, children have that sort of, that, I don't know if you remember being three, four and five, I do. I remember that like incredible knowing and the calling within is the Buddha nature. All efforts to exalt oneself, although they're often misgiven, is actually just a mistake on what's, what we're really searching for, which is using the words of Buddhism, the Buddha nature in ourselves and others. Because again, we can't actually exist without others and so you but this pot everything you do here this is the buddha nature this bodhisattva the reason you're doing this my understanding is your motivation is bodhi means compassionate sattva means being the compassionate being we only connect to others in compassion and care and kindness and appreciation but it's in those higher treasures that it comes to life could you expand on this concept of bodhisattva a little bit? Is it basically that each person is a bodhisattva and thus a compassionate being? Oh, okay. So, the Buddha, Buddhism is really interesting because it has the ten this, the five that, the three, the others, the four what's it's. And all of these things are actually the Buddha's compassion to sort of almost extract a moment of life and go look so that he can put it back in and we can experience oneness. So, how do we know we're alive? Consciousness. We're aware that we're aware. That's how we know we're alive. Consciousness expands and contracts. In its worst contraction, hell, and this can be everything from literally being in a war zone to just being dumped or feeling trapped or hopeless. And the first thing that happens in hell is the next level of consciousness. Desire. The desire not to be in hell, right? Desire. Desire is a powerful thing. Now, I'm going to list con uh, consciousness these have a positive and a negative. Desire for justice, desire for connection. Yeah, right, good. Uh, desire in its own, greed, distribution of wealth, suffering. 
Hell, desire. So desire is just a singular thing. It's just the thing you're desiring. Your consciousness, when you're in desire, is just for the thing you want. That's it. Can't think about anything else. Powerful. Then animality is the next level. In human beings, animality is to despise the weak and fear the strong. That's how it exhibits itself. It's also intuitive and being in flow and stuff, so it has its positive. So hell and desire and animality and then ego. This is a real distortion of me and the universe. Here's me, here's the universe. It's like me, 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 me. Or the inverted version of, oh no, gosh, not me, who am I? I'm not good enough. Same energy, different over invert. Same thing. Hell, hunger, animality, anger, humanity. It's lovely. Fifth world, tranquility. People think, and some Buddhisms do, think that that's the goal. Complete tranquility. It's lovely. The world of humanity and tranquility, but it's so weak and so easy to lose. So, for instance, you're on a train carriage, or maybe a park in May around here. There's children playing, and there's an ice cream van over there, and there's just that lovely sound, that gentle sound of humanity on a warm May day. The birds, and suddenly, oi! Boom! Everyone's like, what? what? Boom, back into hell and run back like that. It goes like that. This is why it's very difficult for the human race to progress out of where we are right now because of the energy underneath hell, desire, animality, ego. Then we reach tranquility, which is lovely, but as I say, quite weak. And then on top of that, or more expanded than that, is rapture or heaven. When you get the thing you really wanted, you really, really, really want it, and then you get it. Just like the new iPhone, oh, brilliant new iPhone. One week later, oh, yeah, new iPhone. I wonder if they're doing another one. Whatever it is. So desire achieved is rapture. Rapture is insatiable and begins to wear off almost the, the moment you have it. You come in from the cold, turn on the heating. Oh, the heating is so grateful for the heating. 15 minutes later, gone, nothing. Why would that be in heaven, though, if it's... It's just called heaven. Oh, I see. As in heavenly place of mm. rapture and joy. When you drink booze, you feel it. Ah, oh, it's, yeah, oh, it's quite expanded, right? It's a cost, but it's quite expanded. So they're called the six paths, six evil paths. It's just that, that all you have to do is get born to experience those. Hell, hunger, animality, ego, humanity, and rapture. And this is the cycle the Buddha saw human beings trapped in. It's just, I don't know who I am, but I want to do something so people invade countries or do this or hurt people or whatever, and then they're creating karma, which is driving impulses to act again, which is creating more karma. You're creating the suffering and blah, blah, blah. And it's just this endless cycle. So the evolutionary imperative in Buddhism is to come out of that. So what's above rapture? Learning. You are very attentive right now, so presumably that's the state you're in. And then what's above that? Realization. When the thing you have learned becomes you. I often use the cigarette example. Cigarettes will kill you. That's learning information. Stopping smoking is the realization of that. Learning and realization require effort. This is the world of the surgeon, the creative, the musician, the scientist, the brilliance of human beings. Sadly, many human beings stop and don't really do that. You might say, I learned something new today. But unless you drive yourself, you'll just remain in the lower six. Or you'll learn and realize a certain amount, draw the line there, and just cut it off. Learning and realization, wonderful, but bring their own arrogance too, and cannot solve the problems of the world. Then something happens. So it's like, as I say, contracted hell and an hunger and animality and anger and humanity. Learning realization is expanded. But then something happens at the next level, which is bodhisattva. We connect to others. We care about others. We feel the sufferings of others like our own. We transcend our own bank account and bling and the things that hold us in greed and anger and ego and we want others to be happy as much as for ourselves it too has a negative side believe it or not to be a martyr to be on the phone for three hours and you're now going through the same thing again then it's like put the phone down i've often done this in the buddhist thing and it's a common thing someone phone up and say okay go and chant nam myoho renge kyo for half an hour and then phone me up afterwards very often People will just go, send a text. Ah, right, I get it. Mm. So although the idea is to reach out and help others, 
compassion for oneself is exactly as important as compassion for others. Indeed, the proportion of the, the amount, the way, the ability, the capacity to be compassionate towards others, others is directly proportionate to the ability to be compassionate towards oneself. And people often mistake this and just give themselves away to others, thinking this is what I should do. But it's coming from a, actually, the lower worlds, if you think about it. Now, all of these things I've said are, each one contains all the other. Oh, I forgot to say the last one. Mm. Buddhahood. This is where not only can you conceive compassionately of the whole human race, you can conceive compassionately of all life on all planets in the entire universe and realize yourself as part of the universe. It's like all time and space, Buddha nature. Is that enlightenment? Enlightenment. Yeah. On its own, it's quite abstract. I am one with all life in the universe. Good for you. But how is that going to help? The, bear, bear in mind, Buddhism is the reason for Buddhism is simply that the Buddha, he had no wisdom, right? The Buddha had no wisdom. Nothing. But what he had was a heart to just think, why do people suffer? The sufferings of birth, sickness, old age and death. He could see these sufferings. The four sufferings of life, as they're called. Everything is born, abides, disintegrates and dies. That sentence did it. This entire planet and solar system will do it. This is again the mystic law. Everything is born, abides, disintegrates and dies everything on the micro and the macro and not flowing with that is a guarantee of suffering but it doesn't mean there isn't suffering within that so he wanted to understand so i won't go into a big long thing about it but eventually he thought well i'm just sitting down here and even if i die i will understand this after 10 years of practicing all sorts of ascetism and he had to go through his fundamental darkness things like you're going to die here and no one will even care. There is no such thing as enlightenment. There's no hope. And he just kept pushing through, kept pushing. And eventually he pushed through. And all that was left, it said that the devil unmasked beats a hasty retreat. Once he broke through, he was able to see crystal clear what was there. Ah, oh, it's life. We're all life. But we make causes and that's why people suffer. And they tried to shed suffering by making more suffering. And he just all saw it all. And so that's, that's, that's the practice. So in other words, Buddhahood is the experience in one's heart. And I'm, I haven't to say, I didn't wake up this morning and feel one with life, the universe and everything. But what I did feel is hope and joy and all that stuff I described. And it expands and contracts. So Buddhahood is only known to us through the practice of Bodhisattva. So they're, they're the purpose of Buddhist practice is to, is to engage in Buddhist practice as a cause and the effect of that is you experience your own Buddha nature. When I first started chanting it was just like I can only describe it as hope and most people feel that chanting you just feel somehow a bit, bit better. So in other words it's like the way you don't have to understand a fireplace to benefit from the heat of it. Mm. You just experience it and that's one last thing to say on this. You can't think your way into this because this is 1% of the consciousness. The other 99% is the heart. That's why I say, but we lock ourselves out from the potential by this endless monologue of me. Monotonous monologue of me, which is hell, hunger, animality, anger. Primarily, that's, that's what that experience is. Yeah. What that do was... you mean the 99% of consciousness is in the heart? So, so the heart in Buddhism refers to, let me, example, so gratitude. You only feel gratitude, yeah? Precisely. You don't think gratitude. You mm. experience it. Heart, and it's amazing. Love, yeah? You don't think love, you experience it. So all the richness of the joy, appreciation, gratitude, and in this case, a sense of being connected with the lives of others, coming from you, from you. I keep touching here as that sort of heart area. That's what I mean. And then the mind goes, hey, this is nice. This is good. Won't last, though. And begins to unravel it in the nature of karma. So this is, it's quite counterintuitive for us because we just rely, we assume our mind is controlling everything. Like, complete delusion. How can it be? We're on a rock spinning like that, firing around, essentially an explosion in space. The core of the earth, I mean, it's just so... This is where Nam of Nam Yoho Ringe Kyo comes in because it 
it also means I entrust, I let go, or better still, I am. So we identify with the voice in our head, but that is the delusion. Now, it's not about getting rid of that or getting rid of the ego. That's a kind of Zen-based thing, no self, no problem. It's a sound philosophy, but it's not really what the Buddha wanted. The Buddha wanted that human beings would realize their own potential. So some people can do the whole no self thing and and experience a type of expansion, but it doesn't help the likes of me. I'm as a total addict. I come from quite a violent background. I was a mess. There's no way I was ever going to start meditating or getting into anything like that. But anyone can chant Namu Horinge Kyo. And that's my experience. Yeah. Wow. There is just so much goodness there and so many wonderful, beautiful concepts that I really understand why people, once they kind of start getting into the philosophy of Buddhism, then they spend years and years studying and trying to understand because there's so much depth to it. Um, Yeah. And so many interesting, wonderful concepts like karma, consciousness, enlightenment, Buddhahood, Bodhisattva. There is just, we can keep going. And that's why we're here to dismantle all of them. The one thing that... um, we've spoken about previously, but mm-hmm. not so far mentioned in the conversation mm-hmm. is the concept of Dharma. Oh, yes. What is Dharma in Buddhism? Traditionally, in the Sanskrit, Dhamma, for some reason there's no or in it, I don't understand that, but it has about 10 or 15 meanings. Things like law, principle, even duty, religion, manifestation, many, many meanings. The Lotus Sutra has the title Sad Dharma Pundarika Sutra. Sat means Wonderful. Dharma means law. The wonderful law or principle of the simultaneity of cause and effect. Teaching. So Dharma is, I would say, I mean I can't speak for all the other Buddhist sects, but for certainly for us it means law. And by law I don't mean legalistic law, I mean the principle, the wonderful principle. Myo is the name given to the mysterious nature of life. Ho, it's manifestations. So it's also the manifest. And like I say, every single thing in this universe follows this. Mio is like emptiness, potential. And then ho is what comes out of it. My mind somehow began that sentence and then it entered into the physical realm through my vocal cords and sound vibration. Mio, ho. Renge, simultaneously, as it left me, it left as a, uh, an effect of that process, but for you it was a cause. So for me, it was an effect of my thoughts. and For you, it's the cause that goes into your ears and becomes the effect, and so on and so forth. So this is Myoho, is, the Buddha's, is what the Buddha became enlightened to. He saw that there was this incredible single law, wonderful law, Myoho, that contained the simultaneity of cause and effect. And that that was actually the the DNA of it all, that explains everything. Everything follows that principle. I mean, the everything, if I can't overstress that. I was thinking even about water. So this water here, right, in this bottle, this water is older than our solar system. It exists, this very water here existed before our solar system. You mean like the molecules? Yes, what's in this bottle? came, existed in this universe before this planet and our sun. Like, this is, this is like, even that's incredible, right? So, in the beginning, there's like this, this, this surge of heat. But it's so hot that the subatomic particles can't even join. So it's just heat with subatomic particles. Then it cools down after about 380,000 years. And the, the electrons do latch onto the proton. And we get the first element, hydrogen, H. Two, O. But there's no O. Where is the O? Where is the O? It's in Mio. It doesn't exist, but it's inherent in H. Because when they come together and collapse in suns and explode outwards, we start to get heavy, heavier elements. So eventually we get to the eight times heavier O. Oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen. You know what hydrogen means? Hydro is water and gen is genesis. Water maker. So water itself is Mio Ho. It didn't exist, now it does. And as it exists here, it exists as the effects of everything I've just described and the cause 
in this case, for me to drink it and stay alive. So, like, you can kind of just take in one small thing in the world, you can see the incredible law of Myo-Ringe is at work in everything. And it's essentially who we really are, as opposed to our temporary identity of Veronica and Pascal and all that. So that's Dharma, the wonderful Dharma, Myoho. Yeah. Wow. Once again, you blew my mind with those kind of physics, and we're going to touch on the okay. physical part later. But the, yeah, just the interaction of how material world is yeah. with, it feels like an all-encompassing, all-containing mantra. Mm, yes. Bam. Mic drop. Yes, that's <laughs> what it is. Yeah. Say that again. <laughs> all, that was it. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah, that's, mm. and that's what Nichiren Daishonen, the Buddha of the Lotus Sutra, who kind of completed what Shakyamuni Buddha started, said too. It's like, if you want to free yourself from all the sufferings and unhappiness that you've endured throughout eternity and connect with this wonderful Buddha that you have, you just got to awaken to this wonderful truth, wonderful meal, truth, ho, that has always been within your life. Chanting it will help you actually experience it. Capital E. Yeah. Nice one. Yeah. Another concept that I'd love to touch on. Mm -hmm. The soul. Oh, yes. So I know <laughs> and I've heard that in Buddhism, there's no such thing as the soul. But I also know that Buddhism believes in reincarnation. Mm. So the idea how... So my idea of reincarnation is that your soul reincarnates into a different body so how so first of all how does the reincarnation process works in buddhism mm -hmm. and why is there no soul wonderful that's one of the best questions if buddhists don't believe in a soul what is it that's reincarnated right so this pertains to an element fundamental element of the buddha's enlightenment so called the middle way the buddha a just in his own life was just saying he was born into a hedonistic life and then he went to the ascetic life and realized that both of those practices were no good. And that's, that's a sort of early or shallow level. Then we go to the deeper level of what that is, which is that fundamentally all people believe in two philosophies. One, permanence. Permanence, the soul, me. I'll always be me and I've always been me and I'll be okay and I won't not live. I won't die, or if I do, some lovely benevolent thing will be looking after me. Permanence, permanence, permanence. The other one is annihilation. Nothing has any meaning. It's, it's just nihilistic, nothing's real, isn't it? Which is a fair perspective, frankly. It's probably more honest than permanence. But it's not very hopeful. And according to the Buddha, it's not actually true. Um, and so this gets to the question, you see. The question is actually coming from the self. The self asks that question because it needs to exist. So let's look at the self in Buddhism. Buddhism says, well, it's a coming together of five components. You're born as a little baby, and hopefully you've got all your faculties. See, here's smell, touch, taste. That's the first component. I hate flying through that because the human body is a universe. And I hate just going to the next one, but I'll just sort of acknowledge that. The body is the first factor. This time-limited spacesuit on this planet, body. I can see here, smell, touch, taste, and the integration of those in the brain. And then that sense of self, self. Perception, well, to see here, smell, touch, taste. Conception, to decide, hmm, what do I think about what I've seen here at smell, touch, taste. Disposition, what you're like, and then consciousness. That's the self. So Buddha says, the self that we call self, that we're so attached to, is a temporary coming together of five aggregates that come together for a little while and then dissolve away. So it's the ego. Well, I'm just, in terms of the question. So consciousness, then, we have a cross-section of consciousness. So we have the body which perceives, conceives through the, the conception and um, uh, disposition are like filters of karma and delusion before it enters consciousness. So, so ideally, to go from perception straight to consciousness is a joy. It's pure experience, right? But generally speaking, it has to go through conception. And now it's just 
conceiving. So we look at something beautiful like the flower behind you and just go, that's a purple flower. That's conception. Perception is, wow, look at the colors. Look at the green. And that's beautiful how the one, it's like really having an experience with it for my consciousness. But it still has to pass through my disposition. If my disposition is to have no regard for flowers, then that's what's going to end up in my consciousness. Hold that thought. The five components are the basics of an existence. Cross-section then of consciousness. So see here, smell, touch, taste, and the integration of consciousness, and then the sense of me, right? That's a level of life, fair enough. But what's this me, and why are we not all the same? That then is underneath that, which is called the eighth, or karma. The storehouse of consciousness, the subconscious which comes up as disposition and conception and even perception. But we're not even, it's deciding what we're seeing. So the subconscious informs the conscious most of the time. So imagine this is a blank screen, right? A, a video screen, a, a cinema screen. That's the mind. There's nothing on it. That's your mind. Then there's a projector over there. That's your karma that's projecting images onto here that you think is you, but it's just coming from what, what you did yesterday or who your mother was or how you started. It's coming from karma. So in terms of the infinity sign, what's producing onto this thing that we think is where we are and who we are is just a blank screen. It almost has no significance. Not only that, but when we die, see, hear, smell, touch, taste, the body and the seven consciousness disappear like they were never there. And all that's left is the residue, the current, the, uh, the, the, we use an electric, the current of your life. The, everything you thought, said and did in one lifetime is contained in this latent energy. And in Buddhist terms, that latent energy uh, returns to the ocean of latent energy in the universe until you get another little baby body with its perception, conception, volition, and then plug it in like, a, like a something in a computer, plug in your eighth consciousness, boot it up, and there you go. And so your consciousness begins to dawn at three, four, five, but you're already reacting in the kindergarten on the basis of who you already are. I've seen my four children be born, so I've lived this. They, I know it's subjective, but they were the person they were the moment they were bored. And then I just watched that play itself out. You, know, you could sort of see who they were in the first weeks. Like, how can you be born with a person with, with characteristics already? It's extraordinary. So, the question: Soul is coming from the self's fear of not existing, which is understandable, but a delusion. That's the question of soul. So, what is reincarnated is is what's already here right now. In fact, I could answer that by saying, "Yeah, here it is right now." This is what it's like to be re reincarnated. Hello. I'm still a bit confused though. So you're saying it's the life energy yes. that reincarnates. Yep. But then, so what's the latency between this energy exiting the body and entering a new body? Where does this energy go in between yes. reincarnations? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Mio. Remember the 10 worlds I talked about, hell and hunger and animality and stuff like that? So let's take the world of... Do you want to ask me that again? No, it's fine. Okay. So let's take the world of anger, for example. You okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You possess the world of anger, right? Yes. You've been angry before. Yes. Right. Where is that now? I guess this emotion had passed. Yeah. There are certain kind of traces that left yeah. within my body, like my memories of it. Like I still know what anger feels like. Yeah. So I guess those imprints you can probably call karma. But the actual experience of being angry, where is it now? In my memory. Can you show it to me? No, because it's in my okay. memory. <laughs> I, I, I'm probably leading you a bit. Trying to, the point I'm trying to make is it is in non-existence. That's what is the answer to your question. We already live surrounded by existence and non-existence. And it's exactly the same thing. In fact, 
of those hell, hunger, animality, anger, humanity, learning, realization, rapture, compassion, only one can ever be manifest at any one time. All the others are in latency, myo. So ho is the manifestation in one moment. So how you think and feel in a moment is what reality is. Behind that is this huge potentiality for change that exists while we're alive. So we are surrounded by the fact that life and death or existence and non-existence are ever-present. And it is the same. Nothing changes on that. So I'm trying to get to a conclusion here. Non-existence is what Buddhism calls death or latency, latent potential. That's where we go. So my mom died in um, November this year and I grieved and it was... Um, it was a mercy and it was beautiful and all those things. But I went back to Ireland uh, where I grew up and used to go to church, to Catholic church and stuff. And it, it, was, it was quite strong there. And I was like, OK. And then was this thing we have to go and see the dead body and meet all villagers and shake hands. It's very beautiful. I mean, they do death really well. They really feel the process of grieving. But I, I was a bit anxious. I was like, oh, it suddenly dawned on me, right? They were saying, right, we're going to be going in 30 minutes. I was staying in my brother, brother's house. We're going to the church in 30 minutes. And I realized I hadn't, oh, I hadn't processed this. So I thought, okay, I'll just nip up to my room. So I up to my room to do some chanting about this. I thought, I need to, you know. And as soon as I started chanting, what appeared in my heart and life was, mom, we're going to see your body. And, and I, there was no finish to that sentence. Because I suddenly realized I was carrying my mom. <laughs> the dead body was meaningless. She was in my heart. She was with me. It was a real profound moment. And it's like there was no fear. There was no anxiety. It was, so it's like, well, where do you go when you die? Well, where are you when you're asleep and not dreaming? That's non-existence. That's death. When you're asleep and not dreaming, that's death. <laughs> deep <laughs> well yeah i mean these 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 are words and concepts and the reason i always talk about the heart is inherent in the life state of buddha is the knowing of this the sense of this so the buddha not only did the buddha see that there was this one wonderful law myoho that contains the simultaneity of cause and effect renge and is pervades everything kyo but actually also life is eternal. And that's why people keep coming back and that's why we seem to be caught, like how does this happen to them and not to them sort of thing. Now, before I get into a hole there about people who suffer, etc., the Buddha sees us as one life. So if one person's dying in a war somewhere, child, it's all of our children in the Buddha's perspective. So there's not a judgment on that. It's a collective. This is the human suffering that gave rise to the Buddha's great quest. So I started to say he had no wisdom. Will you please have got to finish that one? He had no wisdom, but when he, he, compassion led him to that, suddenly he had all the wisdom, Buddha wisdom. So that's, that's important too, and I've completely gone off in another direction. I? Well, that's it. Anyway, that's the Buddhist explanation for life and death. That life is an energy that manifests and then is latent, and manifests and is latent. And it does that every second, of every minute, of every hour, of every year, of every lifetime, of every eternal process. The eternity of life is part of the Buddha's awakening. You don't learn Buddhism, you remember it. So although I'm saying all these things, using words to describe experience, the five components is a brilliant and elegant concept, very easily understood. Um, also, it explains Buddhism on its own, because consciousness is what we experience as life. Our mind is always directing us. We have a thought, yeah, but what if hell? I really wish hunger. Look at the state of them, animality. Every thought directs us into these worlds. And then our earliest memories are from an external thing like we, maybe our first steps even, and our significant others go, ooh, ooh, and so we feel our consciousness expands because of something we did and an external reaction to it. And then that grows, you passed your test, well done, so proud of your consciousness. 
you've got money off oh, you're really beautiful it, it just we're constantly having our consciousness expand due to the external reasons and so by the time we're adults we're looking for ourselves outside ourselves whereas buddhism is saying yeah you can do that or you can expand your consciousness first and then just enjoy the things you've got or don't have and that's the, the, so in itself the, the experience of life of the five components explains buddhism too and consciousness is the ten worlds the expanding and contracting the most elegant for me i feel of all the concepts the ten worlds because they're mutually possessive each one contains the other nine that's how we change moods and how we do it the significant point of that is it means everybody possesses buddha nature as i said from the very first question what's the core teaching Everyone's got Buddha nature. Ten worlds, mutual possession, core teaching, everyone's got Buddha nature. So although some of the stuff I've been saying, and maybe it's just the way I communicate, has been a bit maybe complicated, one can just relax because of this. You're not learning anything new. You're hearing what you already know. That's the beauty of Buddhism. So the mind's trying to control it and own it and stuff. Then that's stupid. But actually... The deeper you is going, yeah, oh, I'm glad we're talking about this. It's like every time you say nam myoho renge kyo, the sort of Buddha nature is going, what? Hey, I know that. But it's kind of, I'm using imagery now, but the point is the Buddha nature is inherent in all human beings. And isn't that a wonderful thing? And it's not mysterious and it's not miraculous and it's not superstitious. It's actually very reasonable. It's, it's got a depth psychology, really. So, yeah, just wanted to add that. Yeah, thank you for that clarification, because I think it's very important for the listeners not to be put off by what might seem to be a complicated yeah. subject on top of another complicated subject. Yeah, really, it's it's simple. Yeah. It's just a lot of complicated words. <laughs> it's a complicated question. Yeah. If we don't believe in the soul, what gets reincarnated? So, yeah, for sure. But but that would be the yeah the explanation. I suggest we finish off with the quantum physics part, because I know okay. you are quite passionate about that. Okay. Yeah, when we spoke about on the phone, mm -hmm. So initially, Paul introduced uh, you to me as somebody who likes to talk about the similarities between quantum physics and Buddhism, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which I thought was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And in your view, then, what are some similarities and overlaps between the two? Thank you. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, uh, this month is my 35th year since I started chanting Nam Myoho Renge And for some reason, I've always been very fortunate that I've been compelled to study as well. So I've been studying Buddhist teachings all this time, specifically a thing called the Go Show, the honorific writings of Nichiren Daishonin, and, and then all the commentaries, and particularly then the contemporary writings of Daisaku Ikeda, who Paul also mentioned as a sort of mentor in the lay people's organization, the value creation organization of Soka Gakkai, to give it its Japanese name. So then also I, I've been blessed that in my later life I've read rediscovered my interest in learning. I left school at 15 and had a bad experience all in all. But suddenly I got really interested in learning everything about everything. So I started, even though I don't have any maths or any, whatever, watching, particularly listening to programs about quantum physics and astrophysics and physics and just all that science stuff, etc. And now and again I go, oh gosh, that's, that's exactly the same as what I've just read earlier on. And a particular example of this, I won't go into a big long time because it's, as you said some of the stuff has been a bit complicated but just to take one aspect the electron which i mentioned at the start phoom, electrons um they're there at the very beginning they are still kind of inconceivable and even the best uh, quantum physics don't really know what they are some aren't even sure they're a thing they have some mass but they're extraordinarily small and they're everywhere and they exchange and they do something really interesting, which is they disappear from existence you know, and reappear somewhere else with no, no action in between. So the electron is neither existence nor non-existence, yet exhibits the qualities of both. The Buddha's realization, life is neither existence nor non-existence, yet exhibits the quality of both. Was, oh, wow, that's really interesting it's the same thing right so that's an example i've got i won't go into many more but that's a really profound example for me 
that actually energy, I mean, all matter is simply energy frozen. So it's all energy. So you have this kind of nothing meal, and then this great expansion of heat, ho, oh, but there's no matter. It's meal, but then it cools down, ho, oh, matter, but there's not much, meal. Then it collapses and explodes out, hey, there's more. Cause and effect, cause and effect, simultaneous all the way through. So you have energy and then matter. Then, on this planet at least, life appears, meal, ho. Oh. Life appears, but it didn't do anything for two billion years. It just sits here. Obviously, maybe that's all it needed to do. So that was life. Difficult to know the consciousness of that, but then consciousness appeared out of life. And then out of that consciousness appeared self-aware consciousness. Right up to this moment now, Veronica, with you and me sitting here, everything I've just described is an unbroken series of Mio Rinke. Like, we are one with that. That too is kind of incredible. And so you can just see how Mioho Ringe plays itself out both in energy, matter, and life and life force. Life force animates matter. So we're in 99% oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. That's what we're made out of. And that's also the distribution in the universe. Life force animates matter. Hello, temporarily. So as I said, my mom's dead body was like, well, that, that, fo that force is no longer there. I've gone into the other question, haven't I? So that's an example of, of how the similarities. Now, there's a lot of woo-woo stuff about quantum. All I'm saying is that the words and phrases, the way to describe it is the same. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And as I said earlier, it feels like the mantra is all applicable. <laughs> yeah. 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 It describes everything and nothing, and the, the everything coming from nothing, and all of that. Yeah. So yeah, and then you can go on about protons, and you can go on about various other things. The field itself is interesting too. The fact that it's not, but let's not go there. I'm not qualified anyway. I've just been listening to a lot of radio documentaries and stuff. I mean, I'd, lo I'd love to explore it more, but every time I do, whether it's biology, physiology, physics, quantum physics, astrophysics. I, I see these similarities coming out with Buddhist teaching, particularly the, the middle way. So it's saying life at each moment permeates the universe and is revealed in phenomena. And then there's that beautiful sentence, one awakened to this, themselves embodies it. I love that. It's just, yeah, beautiful. Anyway, I won't go on too much. Hopefully that's a good example. It's a, it's a, it's a great summary. And so we've actually touched upon this earlier in the podcast, okay. but I'd love to understand more in detail. Why is Buddhism a religion when there is no God in it? Okay. I remember wondering this myself and it seems there, there's no agreement on the origins of the word. Cause I'm always into the def go back to the original. What's the definition, what we're really saying. Here? And then you get a whole kind of understanding. And religion, it seems, has got a little lost and there's no agreement on it. There is a general consensus about it coming from the Latin, religi um, or something like that, which kind of means good faith and also a, what would you call it, a sort of ritualistic tendency. Now, I, I would imagine that when the hominids began to behave differently from your standard great apes, who are just see your smell, touch, taste, and existence without very much, oh, I wonder what that thing in the sky is. We would have started to ritualize our behavior. I, I would imagine in terms of like 250,000 years ago, whatever, you'd, we, you'd see these apes behaving differently. Like because they eat fruit, maybe they'd start to pile the fruit peelings in a space or something like eat the evolution of consciousness from just existence and ape to connecting beyond that. So I suspect that's the origins of religion. And then we go forward and we get more intelligent. But even still, can you imagine when something happens in the day and that night there's a massive thunderstorm? I mean, even today, if you're out in a thunder, the, the noise and the lights kind of go back 150,000 years, there's definitely a God up there. The sun, obvious God, the moon, the fact that you're freezing cold like you're doing now in the January and then flowers, Buddha, flowers appear then turn into fruit that you can eat. So now you're thinking, right, we need to we begin to ritualize it, etc. And then, of course, we got really arrogant and thought, well, it's 
probably looks like us. Yeah, this great creator is probably quite monkey-like. So that's a thing. So then we get God becomes a man, blah, blah, blah. And then we end up with the religions that we have. So Buddhism is not an atheistic religion because it's not doesn't want to antagonize. It's a non-theistic religion. That means we can say, oh, you believe in that? That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, we believe in this and keep the dialogue open as opposed. So it's just non-theistic. Just, I believe in someone says I believe in God that's, that's beautiful I believe in good so the only real difference is one little letter which happens to be a perfect circle I like that to keep the the dialogue open so it's kind of semantics is it a religion I mean if your definition of religion is the relatively superstitious unprovable super entity detached with total agency version then no no definitely not but it's the fifth, half a billion across all the different Buddhisms. So it's, it's kind of up there in terms of world practice. But there again, there are many versions of Buddhism which are semi-monotheistic, who kind of deify the Buddha and, and, and get into superstitions about it and offer things and, and have a distance between themselves and the Buddha. So in a sense, they are more of that religiosity sense than, than what the Buddha was trying to say. It's not me. I'm not special. Don't build statues. It's us. We have the Buddha nature. It's a whole different subject here, isn't it? But yeah, that's what I would say is, is depends on the definition. Clearly, it has the practices and the rituals of religious activity. But when, I, when you turn Nami Horingeki, you are saying, I deeply respect you and all life. I'm one with life. Life is precious. That's kind of what you're saying. So that's a, that's a pretty cool religion, isn't it? To be saying that or to be aspiring to experience that because obviously the karma kicks in and starts having another idea. So yeah, I, I really need to concise my answers. So <laughs> I'm so sorry. I so appreciate <laughs> your very well-structured and long answers. Okay. I think I mean, for, for people especially that are new to this, I think it's very, very helpful for them to okay. like hear oh, all good. the details and breadth of it. Okay. But I think this is a good place to finish. Okay. Thanks, Hal. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you so you much so for coming much. on. Thank you so much. I've loved it. I love talking about Buddhism and I love what you're doing. The calling within, as I said, it means Buddha nature. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.